Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. A sense of the transcendent or the invisible power around us has largely been lost by people, either diminished or distorted, so that uh, very often we end up not being in touch with our deeper experiences. In our culture, largely we find that we have no language for talking about the really important matters that uh, are of vital concern to us. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Father Jim Troutwine, Episcopal Chaplain at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of the Eclipse of Mystery. Here's Father Basic. Jim, it's good to have you on the program. And I understand back. that you were interested <laughs> in uh, talking a bit about uh, the book that I have recently had published called Apologetics and the Eclipse of Mystery. And since you're probably one of the few people in the world who have read the book or ever will read it, I thought that we might uh, as well pursue that topic. Well, I'm not accustomed to an author being quite as modest as all that. I think the book is well worth reading. I am interested in some of the things that you've been doing and getting people here acquainted with Rahner's thinking. Yeah, that's, I have certainly used the theology of the German Jesuit, Karl Rahner, in trying to deal with what I think is a contemporary problem. Maybe it would be good if I just said a bit of what I was trying to do in the book. I, I think, think it is based really on um, an analysis of our cultural situation. The book is entitled Apologetics and the Eclipse of Mystery. We might stay on that eclipse of mystery for a moment because I think in my mind it suggests a, a large part of what the problem is in our contemporary culture. That is that a sense of the transcendent or the invisible power around us has largely been lost by people, either diminished or distorted so that uh, very often we end up not being in touch with our deeper experiences. In our culture, largely we find that we have no language for talking about the really important matters that uh, are of vital concern to us. I can perhaps make that concrete in a, in a number of particular ways. You remember the case where the seminary students came to Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wanting to talk about uh, the question of death. Yes. And... Um, she said, well, I don't know much about it, but let's go to a hospital and try to talk to some dying people. So they went to the hospital and to talk to these dying people, and they asked to see some of them. And the hospital administrator said, well, we don't have any dying people here. And it was right then that Elizabeth Ross knew that we had a problem. So that would be one way in which uh, the culture in which we live impoverishes us. We generally have not had a good way of talking about the whole problem of death. Uh, it has been an element in our life that has to be put to the side. People uh, generally end up not being able to face it. It becomes uh, more anxiety-producing maybe than it even has to be under better circumstances. Yes, but there's a question I would ask about this. The same thing is not true in some other older countries. Older cultures handle death pretty well. They're acquainted with it. They're aware of it. Uh, they handle it compassionately. Uh, they don't attempt to cover it up, and one of the things they find most striking about our culture when they visit here is the fact that even at the moment of death, in the way we handle funerals and the things attendant upon funerals, we, we sort of avoid talking as though the, the person really were dead. Yet in their cultures also, there has been a loss of a sense of mystery, a loss of a sense of the infinite, um, a consequent trivializing of ordinary life. Yes, I, I certainly think that's true. And what I think you're going to find is in the modern industrial Western world, exactly. there is generally this eclipse of mystery. It will probably manifest itself in varying ways. Now, since we are such a youth-loving culture and have decided to put our old people to the side, perhaps uh, this problem of death uh, epitomizes this whole problem for us in the United States. 
I think oh. that's a fair statement. Although I believe that you're going to be able to see it carried out in other ways. It could take the, the question of sin, something we've seen within the churches. I'm thinking of Carl Menninger's book, Whatever Became of Sin, mm-hmm. where Menninger castigates the clergy for no longer speaking about sin and says that because the churches have not done their job on this, that there has been this vague malaise that has overcome us as a culture and a people. Since we are not able to admit, yes, I sinned in this particular way and accept responsibility for it and feel the forgiveness of God for it, since we can't do all of that, we end up with this vague kind of anxiety hanging over our heads. Again, I would say that this is part of this eclipse of mystery. It's taking this deeper kind of question of the matter of the heart and its response to the good God and saying, no, we can't talk about that. We will talk about it in terms of neuroses, something that you can manipulate and control. So you can have a handle on that. You can work it out in psychotherapy. And, and then the whole problem, it becomes a problem rather than a mystery. I use that distinction a lot. It's actually borrowed from the existentialist thinker Gabriel Marcel, who said that a problem is something that is sort of objective. It's out there. I can deal with it. I can try to figure out how to solve it. Um, it, it admits of solution in one way or another, whereas mystery is something I participate in. I'm part of. Mystery is that which is essentially unknowable to me and something that I more have to wrestle with rather than solve. I'm immersed in it, and it sort of uh, takes me over in many ways. But haven't you there touched a situation that, that, that hits us, I think, particularly in the United States? We're supposedly a pragmatic people. Other people tell us this is the way we're different from them. We, we, we call ourselves practical. We're always dealing with success-oriented things. If you don't make a success of this or that, then there's something very wrong with you. And consequently, we try to reduce everything to the level of problems. We phrase things in terms of problems, and we do this exactly because we consider that a problem is something that has a solution. The idea that a given uh, uncomfortable thing may be not a problem to which there is somewhere an an easy key, but may rather be a condition that we have to live with. Uh, This we find uncomfortable. We regard it as a defeat, uh, even to admit the existence on those terms uh, of such a difficulty. We consider to be, in some sense, a, a, a hoisting of the white flag. We're giving up. And And I think that's a bad mistake. Yeah, it's exactly right. You can even look at the way death does get raised as a question. When it does become part of a curriculum in in school or it becomes finally a topic you can talk about, it's often in terms of, well, how are you going to freeze bodies so that eventually, you know, it could bring people back. A mechanical solution. That's right. You've got a problem again rather than a mystery in which we are immersed and have to wrestle with and finally submit to in one way or another. Uh, Jim, something that doesn't come up in the book, but it might be relevant. I'll just throw this out, and if you don't like it, we'll go on to something else. Mm -hmm. To what degree is the church and its own leadership culpable in this matter? We have for a long time tended to trivialize things like sin. We've reduced it to ritual offenses. The idea of sin as something that in fact separates a person from God, something as awesome or as final as that, we we put aside. We've instead tended to make of of sin, uh, well, depending on your religious tradition, it's a question of of whether you do or do not conform to this or that little regulation, whether you uh, eat meat on Friday or go to a show on Sunday or play cards when you shouldn't or something. To what degree have we also in our, our, our common religious life, tried to reduce religious effort to uh, whether we've had a success in the most recent building program. Uh, to what degree have priests or, or ministers been judged in the so-called success of their career uh, by the way in which they have uh, increased this or that project rather than dealt with the the whole matter of what used to be called the devout life, in the terms of your own book, the individual confrontation of a person with the gracious mystery. I think that very often the churches have been part of the problem rather than any solution to it, precisely because we have bought into the culture. Of course, any time you're going to talk about the church in the United States, it has to be in terms of a cultural analysis, because the Mm -hmm. church never exists in a vacuum. The, we, the ch- members of the church, the people that make up the church, are also the citizens of the country. 
we end up being influenced by the culture in which we live, by the governmental style we have, etc. So that I think you are absolutely right that very often the churches have um, ended up um, really intensifying the problem. Now, you, you, you raise that question, the devout life. Maybe people will often talk about that these days in terms of the spiritual life. People will say that, well, I don't get any spiritual nourishment from my church. Yes. Or even I can't even find clergymen who want to talk to me about the spiritual life, the deeper kinds of questions. I mean, where does one find a forum for wrestling with grief and suffering and death? Uh, with trying to deal with the great human questions of what my freedom amounts to and what am I to make of my life and where am I going and so on. Sometimes people feel that the churches have sort of abdicated that whole role of being the spiritual guide for people or being the place where the great human questions are discussed or where there is a wisdom brought upon the kinds of difficulties that we all encounter in our lives. In the church, well, setting the rest of the culture aside for just a moment, has this been uh, chiefly noticed in a desire for popular preaching instead of systematic teaching? The business of trying to organize Christian people for what in the classical Protestant world were uh, class groups. People came together and lived uh, their whole lives as a member of a group that met systematically and regularly to study. Uh, within the Catholic world, the whole structure of school systems up to and including you know, the university world. Uh, this has been set aside. Preaching is regarded now as outrageously lengthy if it goes past a 10-minute homily. Uh, publications simply don't uh, deal with these things, and if they do, they're not sold. Now, what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so well, eventually in, in this program, we're going to try to find some time to talk about solutions as well. But uh, as long as we're still uh, trying to enunciate the problem here, we might... Um, deal with that for a minute. Uh, it seems to me that what happened very often is that the education itself became rationalistic. Now, maybe I'm speaking out of, yes. mostly out of the Catholic tradition here, but very often what happened is religious education dealt mostly with the matter of the head, and it almost made it sound as though we could manipulate this God who we all believed in, and that there were these dogmas or doctrines that could be memorized and somehow would put you in touch with who God is or that there were so many prayers that you ended up knowing and saying, and that could somehow gain God's favor, for example. Again, so a think, mechanical solution. Right. I, I think, again, it reducing the mystery. In other words, the mystery gets eclipsed. And I'm using the word mystery all the time throughout this book. I'm talking, you know, in our theological terminology, about God. I mean, the God who is always yes. incomprehensible, who's inexhaustible, who's always beyond all words and images. I remember St. Thomas Aquinas' line that the most important thing you can know about God is that we don't know him, that he's beyond all of our words and images and categories. And uh, therefore, I think that often the education uh, didn't portray that. It was as though the church could had a handle on God or had a hold on God, that, that the church was God's house in a sense, and that the church could simply mediate that God to people in a straightforward, one-to-one, -one, literal, and even at times fundamentalist way. And the I weekly think filling station. Right. That yes. was the image of the sacraments, wasn't it? You come yes. there and get filled up with, with grace. And, and the great mysterious character of God often was lost in the education. And this occurred not just in grade school or high school levels, but in seminaries as well. People could go through whole seminary courses and not be in touch with the whole thing that we call the negative theological tradition, which keeps reminding us of the unknowable character of God, or all that the great mystic saints told us about God, that the experience of God is dark, and there's the dark night of the soul, and that the absence of God is a great part of uh, authentic religious experience. So all of that side of it, which leaves God this gracious mystery or this incomprehensible one, was often lost in, throughout the whole educational process. So therefore, again, the church becomes part of the problem that we see in the culture as a whole, which is excessively heady or rationalistic. What was Chesterton's line? Maybe you remember it better than I do. Something about uh, the rationalist is one who has lost everything except his mind uh, or his reason. He's, he, he's lost all of the other good things of life. He's he zeroed in so much on logic, on reasonableness, and so on, that 
everything else is gone. You know, I'm very fond of Chesterton, but I I haven't come across that one. Well, I didn't quote the line right. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) If I said it right, maybe you would remember. One of the things we'll look up later on. Uh, Coming back to the book, I know the book is written not for the general public, but uh, one of the things that I kept thinking about in going through the book was the fact that you have... uh, succeeded in delivering to us a highly intellectual presentation of a problem which ultimately is not intellectual. And that's this apprehension, this facing of uh, any person into uh, what is essentially not knowable by him and recognizing this, that it's above him, beyond him. Mm -hmm. And many people don't want to do that. They want God to be domesticated. They really want a situation in which they can comfortably think about God as a kind of a Santa Claus, even a figure that looks a little like Santa Claus. Right. You remember the the category I talked about in the first chapter? I called them the pipeline yes. believers, Yes. which maybe was sort of a happy image for what you're talking about that, there. That is, people who talk a lot about God, in fact, pray a lot, the people associated at times with the fringes of the evangelical or charismatic movement, who have, I think, in one other way, distorted the image of God. They've made it seem as though by saying a certain number of prayers that one can get whatever one wants from that God. That God is the kind of Santa Claus, and if you're just good enough, then life will all break your way. Everything will go good for you. What they've distorted here is the authentic, mysterious character of God, which exceeds all of our expectations. And they've also distorted the notion of this, the, the awesomeness of God. You know, in Rudolf Otto's classic study, or the idea of the holy, he points out that authentic religious experience always has two kinds of things going in. One is the fascination, the drawing, the positive side of the closeness, the nearness. people to nearness. a great fire. Right. On the other hand, it, it, there is also this awesome character, almost a scary side of God, a dark side. It, it's found in the Hebrew Scriptures so beautifully, like you even touch the Ark of the Covenant, you will surely die. You look at the face of God, and you okay. cannot survive that. Isaiah, I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, you see, what happens among the pipeline believers? The, these elements within the modern evangelical movement talk so positively about God, so surely about God, so clearly that they know God's will without any doubt, as though he almost whispers it in their ear, and that God can almost be coerced into giving good things if you simply gra- gather the right prayer group or say the right prayers or have enough openness of heart. They have uh, lost what Otto talked about in terms of the awesome character of God. So you see, the distortion of mystery in our culture is not simply on the part of the secularists, people who have moved into sort of an atheistic camp or who have no room for uh, any sort of um, beyond or transcendence, who are so zeroed in on the computer, that not only those people, but also the charismatics and the evangelicals who want to manipulate God. I've talked about that sometimes in two images. One I call the cult of the computer, in which it's thought that everything important about life can be put on this computer card or analyzed in terms of data or rationality. On the other hand, I talk about the cult of the extraordinary, that is, people who want to emphasize the great dominant religious experience, the strong, striking conversion experience, the the moment when God's will is unmistakable, and doing so to such a degree that one loses the general sense of mystery that is to be found in the ordinary things of life. Yes, and there is something. You talked about the secularists not being the only problem. I remember years ago being taught by a seminary professor whom I greatly respected, a little tagline that behind every heresy there is a prior apostasy. Behind every um, distortion of the faith by whatever group, there is a prior ignoring or denying of some element of the faith by its own people, Uh, a a simple forgetting of what is important. Until ultimately, uh, in that vacuum, uh, something enters to, to distort it. And I think we've had a good deal of this in terms of the mystery, but the, we haven't touched on the area where I think this has most uh, often, most frequently happened. Not every uh, Christian, individual or group, not every Christian, is going to be engaged in intellectual pursuits. They do all worship. That's the common denominator. 
And to what degree have we uh, set outside their experience a worship which does put them face to face with the majesty of God? You mentioned the vision of Isaiah. Eastern spirituality uh, has always held this as a high model. Western spirituality, whether one goes all the way from uh, the most uh, plain evangelical to the most solemn Catholic rites, have always been pretty short uh, on the mystery and pretty long on the rationale. Uh, I wonder to what degree anything is being done today uh, to, to correct this or to change it or to broaden uh, the experience of Western Christians. I think, uh, again, part of our problem is concerned with our liturgical practice, and perhaps in the Catholic world it's been one of the claims that as a result of our liturgical reform that we have lost something of the sense of reverence or mystery or awe in our liturgy. And I think that uh, perhaps we see the beginning of some shifts on this, although I, I'm not sure that we're in a position yet to, to come up with the proper way of making mystery real to people in our contemporary world. So I would think that the liturgical renewal still has this task ahead of it. In other words, there's been a lot of, of uh, uncluttering being done and a lot of getting rid of things that were unintelligible to people. But the next step of finding the right symbols, the right way of making the liturgy meaningful to people and the right way of making God truly transcendent and beyond and awesome, but we, we probably have not found that. Well, I'm realizing before I go on to that that I have, have passed up a point you made earlier that I want to go back to, and that is you said something about in the book I take a highly intellectual approach to dealing with something that is really not intellectual. And I'd like to get back to that for a minute because I think what, the, what I'm trying to do in the book is to, to offer positive solution to this problem, which is fundamentally to enable people to get in touch with the mystery dimension of their ordinary experience, to att help attune people to finding God in their everyday life, trying to enable people or facilitate reflection upon their regular experience, the experience that they have of life in general, and to find in there a deeper dimension. The, the problem for many of us is that, that our experience is so fleeting that we never get to look at it. The problem is we off, we're, we're so busy, we're flitting around on the surface, and we need our time to look deeper within ourselves. That's one the way I often think of liturgy as sort of stop action, a time when we turn the world uh, off for a minute, our ordinary progression of things, and set aside a sacred time for ourselves when we're, we're not moving out of our experience or out of history, but we're stopping our ordinary experience so we can look at it, so we can remind ourselves what it's all about or where it fits into a larger scheme or how we might have found God within all of that. In practical terms, it's a business of taking an hour out on Sunday and saying, thank you, God, for all those good things that happened during the week and reminding myself that they were all gifts taking the distortions and illusions and sins that I put into that week and saying, God, I need forgiveness for that. seems to me that's the way liturgy would end up in helping us deal with this problem. But and in order to do that, you are presupposing a period before one enters the liturgy of reflection, of personal examination, of some silence and, and, and consideration. And I think that presupposition has to be brought out and made explicit. It's an essential part of it. It does, absolutely. And that is why is you're back to this ordinary experience again. What I'm trying to do in the book is show that religious experience is not some far-out thing that a few mystical people have, but religious experience is the, an element in our common human experience, that all of us have that opportunity, that everything in our world is potentially revelatory to us. Anything can speak to us of our God. Our most ordinary mundane activities of going to work and doing our jobs, meeting our responsibilities, uh, getting our recreation, all of those things have a deeper dimension, and we need to be in touch with that. And that is why absolutely liturgy will not work. You can't have the one hour of the week if you ha and be in touch with God if throughout the whole week he's been absent from your life. And that's why in the book I try to point us to really common things. As uh, In the, one of the later chapters I try to do those models of mystery, as I call them. And one is to look at our personal relationships, 
the way we deal uh, with other human beings, and look at the way the love relationships work, both when it's ideal, when it's working well, and also when we fail, when we're selfish and self-centered, and try to point out to people how all of that could end up revealing God to us how we could find God in just interacting with other people on an ordinary daily basis, within family life, within married life as we know it. And this, um, I think, would, uh, would be really Im- important. In other words, I think your point is well taken. Liturgy isn't going to work or get us in touch with God or help us be, overcome the eclipse of mystery unless we're doing something on a regular basis in that regard two things, perhaps. One is the necessity, then, for some period, some skill in knowing periods of of withdrawal, of silence, that we live in a world that's extremely uh, busy, and that busyness sometimes uh, chokes off what we do. The other is perhaps a realization of something that Jesus said, that that, uh, our faith is a kind of salt. It isn't just one more course on the table. It's something that has to flavor all of the courses that are already there. I like that image. I think that's exactly right. Both points you make, I think, are extremely valuable, and that is that this finding the time of silence and reflection. How are we going to be able to, to really understand what is going on in our life unless we can step back at times and see where was the hand of God in it? Where was this mysterious dimension? And we all probably have to find our own rhythm that way. Maybe it's having five minutes in the morning or few minutes before we go to bed at night when we try to work on that problem. And the other image, I think, that the salting of the whole of life is is really helpful. My contention is that religious experience is available to all of us. It's a dimension of our common experience, and what we have to end up is getting in touch with that. Our problem is for many of us that it has been eclipsed in many ways. What we've got to do is to learn to get in touch with it and to see it again in a fresh and new way. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Father Jim Trout Wine, Episcopal Chaplain at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. The topic of this week's Reflections was the Eclipse of Mystery. If you have any questions about today's program, or if you have any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson, Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner. <laughs> Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network in cooperation with the Diocese of Toledo.